This is the big challenge that really drew me to want to teach statistics and, and data science. It's how do you make this topic fun for students and engaging? That first class is so critical. Hello, I'm Lindsay Aiken, and I manage career services at the Department of Management Science and Engineering at Stanford University. Welcome to ms &E Stories and Voices, Graduating Student Profiles. Having a great teacher can be life-changing. As I think back to my schooling from primary level through masters, I can identify a few standout teachers, and I'm sure that you can too. Those who seemed born to it, those who inspired you to reach new heights, those who got you thinking about things in a new way. And while we often hear teaching described as a calling, what we don't hear about so much is how life-changing teaching can be for the teacher the story behind their getting started in their profession, and their philosophies for their approach to energizing their students. This is why I'm delighted today to talk with graduating PhD student Josh Grossman, because his love of teaching is so clear. Josh, thank you so much for being with me today. Let's start with a little bit about your background and what brought you to Stanford and MSNE. &E. Great. Um, thanks so much for having me. I have a little bit of a windy path to MS&E. As an undergraduate, I studied neurobiology, thinking I wanted to be a doctor. At the time, I also did a lot of teaching and tutoring. And sort of by chance, I had been teaching this statistics sort of boot camp for, for high school level statistics. And about midway through college, when I realized neurobiology wasn't, wasn't for me long term, I didn't want to be a doctor. I decided to take more statistics and data science classes and really developed a love for the subject. And when I graduated college, you know, in my mind, I, I wanted to come back to statistics and data science at sort of some point in the future. Um, I did two years as a product manager in, in education technology before returning back to the research world to work with uh, Sharad Goyle, who's a former ms &E professor now at the Harvard Kennedy School on topics related to the intersection of, of criminal justice, data science, and statistics. How do, was it that you came to be working with Shara? Because I know you didn't do your undergrad here. Yeah, so I was working uh, at an education technology company that was based in San Mateo, pretty close to Stanford. Um, I had a lot of family that lives in the Bay Area. And so, you know, Stanford was close by, uh, wanted to, you know, stay where it was warm. And so what I had actually done was I looked through large lists um, of Stanford professors, really just saying, what would I be interested in researching? I came in with sort of this interest in, in criminal justice as a result of a friend that reached out to. She worked at the prison law office in Berkeley. I, you know, I knew nothing thing about the carceral system, I asked for a required reading list. So I started reading a couple books on, on incarceration, and I, I realized this is something I, I really wanted to work on. And so I thought, you know, can I put this together with data science, criminal justice, and, you know, do some research related to those topics. So again, went through a big list of Stanford professors. Charid was sort of the first person on that list. Uh, the research was really well aligned. I reached out to him and, and started as a research assistant with him before eventually becoming a PhD student under him. So Sharon, I'm going to imagine just knowing his personality encouraged you to apply to us for a PhD? Exactly. Exactly. You know, I started working with him as sort of a research assistant, sort of thinking about just becoming a data scientist in the future. But Shard was very encouraging about pursuing a PhD. He thought it'd be, you know, great preparation for a future career. Uh, he knew I had a big interest in teaching and, and was thinking about, you know, becoming a university professor at some point in the future. Um, and so he thought, you know, this this made a lot of sense for me to, to get that data science training while also um, getting just rigorous training and research and preparing me for potential career in academia. The list that you gave there of kind of these different research areas that you were looking at whilst you were a research assistant with him, that's a really great diversity subjects close to your heart, I know. So as we think, though, about what's really the closest to your heart, this teaching is coming up again and again for you. And so, you know, here at Stanford, we boil our mission down to teaching and learning. What's been your experience on that teaching side of things? Yeah, so Stanford has been incredibly supportive of my development as an instructor and somebody who really loves teaching. I've mentored almost 20 undergraduates through the ms &E department. We've hosted students over the summer. We've run data science boot camp for high school students interested in data science. I've been able to, you know, both TA and, and lecture as sort of an instructor of record. I'm actually just now wrapping up I'm the core undergraduate applied statistics class, ms &E 125, as, as the main instructor. I did the same thing back in 2022 and, and really loved it. Those experiences are really what solidified my plans to want to pursue a teaching focused career in academia um, after I graduate. To back things up a little bit there, you've been teaching this 
course, this undergraduate course for a couple of years here. How did that come about? Because that's not always what our PhD students will do. You know, I, I TA'd the class back in 2021 for the first time. Um, when Sharad was actually the professor for MSNE 125. But when Sharad moved institutions, the department needed somebody to teach the class. And Sharad knew I was really interested in teaching. I TA'd it before really successfully. And so the department you know, allowed me to actually be the main lecturer for the course back in 2022. That went very well. So I ended up doing it again um, this year in 2024. So obviously teaching something that is this clear passion of yours with your tutoring that you were doing way back when through to teaching this course now, is that what you're going to be continuing with moving forward after graduation? I started tutoring when I was, I think, 14 years old, and I would have never expected to have the same job in some ways as I did when I was 14. But yeah, I'm I'm actually continuing on to be a uh, assistant teaching professor. This is a sort of interesting tenure track role that the uh, University of California system started pretty recently for people to take on these professorships that are you know heavily heavily focused on teaching. You also do a bit of research, but really your main job is is to you know develop undergraduate programs. Um, teach these really, really large classes and make the sort of learning experience for especially undergraduates really strong. So I'm continuing as an assistant teaching professor at UC Berkeley. So just moving right across the bay. So that sounds like this big shift in teaching where it has traditionally been very research focused. And that's what people often will want to do. This, by the sounds of it, is very teaching focused. I'm curious the challenges then of making those tenure decisions when the position is teaching focused rather than the traditional importance of research and that publish or peril mentality that we hear about. How is that going to look for that tenure decision for you? Yeah, my sense is that, you know, student evaluations become a big part of the tenure decision, sort of success in developing undergraduate programs, you know, outreach to the community, things related more to instruction become the core part of the tenure decision. Uh, you're also expected to complete some degree of scholarship, whether that's something like, you know, writing a paper a year, which is something I'd like to continue doing, or writing a textbook. Um, there's lots of different ways you can satisfy the scholarship requirement. To my understanding, the main tenure decision, sort of tenure factor is your quality of instruction. That's great. Having high quality teachers is such an important thing. My 11 year old just finished with elementary school yesterday. So it's something that's been on our minds in this house quite a lot. So that research part of things then, will you be continuing with the criminal justice area, do you think, or are there other things that you're interested in as well? Yes, yeah, so I'm certainly broadly interested in the intersection of public policy in data science, but I am continuing a lot of this criminal justice work. During my PhD, I completed a project where we partnered with a federal district court to investigate potential racial disparities in pretrial incarceration. And so I'm actually have another relationship with a separate federal district court that's interested in a similar question. Their process runs a little bit differently. Um, and so that's one of the projects I'm, I'm sort of continuing working on, you know, past the PhD and, and into this teaching focused career. I have some other data I've been sitting on for a little while related to uh, public housing. So that's another research area I'm sort of interested in and, and will work on. Another big part of this role is, is sort of involving undergraduates in your research. And so these are both projects I'm really excited to take on a couple students who are thinking about potential future careers in research and data science or in public policy. Yeah, clearly for you, this mentoring and helping to grow and develop the next generation to come through is something that's really important to you. And with that, I mean, stats and data science, doing neither of those myself, but aware that they have what's probably really an unfair reputation for being a bit stuffy of subjects, uh, maybe a little bit dry sometimes and boring. What's going to be your strategies and how are you going to be challenging that perception that people might have those subjects and, and making them engaging for your students beyond kind of the few that will be able to do these research projects with you? Yeah, this is this is the big challenge that really drew me to want to teach statistics and, and data science. It's how do you make this topic fun for students and engaging? That first class is so so critical because if students aren't engaged by the material, it's unlikely that they're going to continue with the subject because there isn't that promise like there is of studying biology, becoming a doctor, or studying chemistry, going into pharmaceuticals. It's, it doesn't have that that same degree of, of promise of, of this like future career. 
maybe a little bit now with data scientists, but it's definitely tricky. So I guess I'll, I'll sort of go back a little. And, you know, I started teaching statistics by accident. You know, I, I was taking statistics myself as a high school student and somebody was flying home to teach the statistics boot camp. They, on the way down, realized they had totally forgotten a lot of the material and they knew me. And so they reached out and asked if I wanted to teach it. And I was in sort of the, the class at the time. Um, and I didn't have any particular interest in the subject. You know, I, I was just sort of taking it in school. The, the material itself was pretty dry. We had a great instructor, but it, you know, it really was dry material. But only after teaching this class, you know, that year, the year after, the year after, did I realize, oh, this is pretty interesting material. And I, I don't think most people have that experience. So this challenge of, of getting people to really love statistics and be excited by it in that first, first class is difficult, and but it's really fun. So for example, in my applied statistics class this year, we do lots of tactile examples. So earlier in the quarter to learn the topic of sampling distributions, you know, instead of just talking about repeated sampling sort of in, in the hypotheticals or even just putting pictures up on slides, students are actually opening up bags of M&Ms and are like counting the colors of M&Ms to figure out this hypothetical M&Ms machine and how it's generating these different colors. We're thinking, you know, questions like, well, how many students at Stanford actually wear their helmets? When they should be biking, right? We, we'd we'd hope that everybody probably is zero. I feel like I never see students wearing the helmets. Exactly, but the number is very small. But there actually isn't any official statistic out there about like how many students are actually wearing helmets. And so students, as part of a homework assignment, we're going out and actually counting. You know, when bikes pass, who's wearing a helmet, who's not. During class, we would have randomized experiments that students didn't realize were randomized experiments, where they would you know scan a QR code and it would send them to one of two different surveys. And then after I would show them the results of these surveys or they would work with that information on their homework. Um, and so getting students to engage with their own data, I think, is really exciting for them. Generating their own data is really exciting and, and sort of bringing in these tactile examples and, and making statistics not just something that's on a page, not just something that's you know purely theory, but, but something they can sort of see and feel, I think, gets people more excited about the topic. So, you know, I have lots of other strategies as well, but I think that's one of the big ones, just making statistics really visual and tactile for students right right from the get-go. And then obviously, you know, with my position, I think about careers all the time, getting your education at Stanford and then the applying it to the real world. I mean, we see this with little kids all the time. Like, why do I need to learn math? What am I ever going to do with this? So then it's like, well, you know, as you're building your budgets or as you're doing a construction project and need to measure things, you need to know fractions and, and all of these real world applications of these skills. I always feel like, that's such a good way of getting people excited about things too. So question here of if you weren't going to be a teacher, but wanted to have a career in statistics and data science, what are the sorts of things that you think would be exciting or interesting career paths with that knowledge base? Personally, the, the careers I would be really interested in, again, would be at this intersection of public policy and data science. So for example, I interned as a as a researcher, research data scientist at a nonprofit that's still going called Recidivis that builds tools to help reduce incarceration just broadly. They do lots of different things. And you know, I really loved my work there. And all likelihood, if I wasn't pursuing a teaching career, you know, I'd likely be reaching out to organizations like that to see, you know, are they interested in hiring more data scientists? Um, I have a friend who works at the ACLU as a data scientist. That would be a really interesting career. So likely nonprofit data science or mission-oriented data science would be something um, that I'd be really interested in. And that makes a lot of sense to thinking about the student body and this interest that we see increasingly in social good and careers for social good, that there's a lot of things that statistics and data science can be used for there as well as in kind of more traditional industry fields. So Josh, this is all being so fascinating. And again, I'm just so excited to see where your teaching career is going to take you because with the enthusiasm and clear passion and love that you have for it, I'm sure it's going to be far. And there are just innumerable students out there that are really going to benefit from your teaching and mentoring and guidance, even if it is at Berkeley. <laughs> we'll ignore that part of it. I am going to segue now into the final three questions that I always ask all of my guests. And the first one of those is, what would be your advice for someone coming into the PhD program, but a little bit outside the box that they might not have heard from someone else already? You know, I think something that's easy to forget as a PhD student, really anywhere, is to explore the surrounding community, both Stanford and, and beyond Stanford. I think it's really easy to spend a lot of time, you know, in the PhD corrals and just work there and then go home afterwards. 
you know, maybe you take a little walk, you know, not too far, but Stanford has a lot of really magical spaces. So, you know, things like the top of the art building, you know, something I discovered really late in my PhD was the, the top floor bender room in Green Library for studying the beautiful building on the hill that sort of hidden the Center for Computer Research and Musical Acoustics. Uh, also really cool. And then beyond Stanford, there's lots of great stuff. You know, for example, I had a friend in the MSNE master's program and, you know, several times a week close to when he was graduating, we would drive down together to Sunnyvale to have, you know, the best tacos we'd ever had in our lives. And so, you know, lots of other things in Palo Alto and Sunnyvale and lots of other cities in the area that have just these sort of wonderful things going on. You know, the public libraries are really wonderful too. So, you know, take the time to, to sort of go beyond just the desk where you're doing lots of your research. I love that. That focus too on just on the balance that yes, you're doing a PhD, but you've still got a whole life outside of that as well. And then secondly, your life maxim, that nugget of wisdom that you have that future grandkids and nieces and nephews are going to roll their eyes at, but also know that you're right. <laughs> sure. You know, I'll, I'll pick something that came from my own grandparents and I learned later was from Maya Angelou. And it's something I try to remember when I teach or really just sort of exists as a person, but people will forget what you said or what you did for the most part, um, but they'll remember, you know, how you, how you made them feel. So for example, in the classroom, you know, when I think back to my favorite classes, maybe I don't remember what was being taught on a particular day, but I do remember that sort of special magic feeling during some of the lectures where, I, you know, just you could feel the electricity in the room and, and how exciting it was to learn. And so my goal when I'm teaching, I mean, again, just sort of being a person is like to create those magical experiences because, you know, why else are we living this life but, but to enjoy those you know, sorts of experiences? Yeah, I love how you're tying that together with your career and your teaching philosophy and how you're going to do all of that. And then finally, two books and a podcast. So the two books that everybody should read, one of them MSNE related or adjacent, other one completely free choice, and then a favorite podcast as well. Sure. So before I joined MSNE, you know, I knew I needed to improve my data science skills from just the couple classes I'd taken as an undergraduate. And so just sort of by chance, I stumbled on this book, R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham, who's an adjunct professor at Stanford and lots of other places too. It's an online free textbook. Anyone can read it. If you've taken, you know, one computer science class, you're, you're ready to sort of read this book. But when I finished this textbook and sort of working through the exercises in it, that's not normally something I recommend to go end to end through a textbook. This one, I, I would say do it. I really felt like I could be a data scientist and I could I could do damage with what I had already learned. And that sort of gave me the confidence to feel like I could finish a PhD and, you know, take on heavy duty data science work. So R for Data Science is sort of the MSNE related book that I'd recommend. Um, not MSNE related book. I'm horrible at, at picking, you know, superlatives. But one book that really comes to mind from the last couple of years is Small Teaching. It's a, a sort of a classic in the educational, you know, pedagogical literature that talks about lots of different small, small things you can do in a classroom that are backed by research that have these, you know, really, really large effects. And so, you know, it's a lot of simple things that you might expect and seem sort of obvious in hindsight, but then other things that aren't so obvious that, you know, once you implement them in a classroom, the research really says, your students are going to learn better. They're going to have better time. You know, the classroom is going to be more effective. So this book, Small Teaching, I think is really, really excellent for anyone who's trying to improve their teaching skills, especially if they're going to be applying those teaching skills in the classroom. Um, and then for a podcast, um, I listen to lots of different podcasts, but one of the podcasts I started listening to maybe five or six years ago, maybe even longer than that at this point, is The Moth. It's an organization that's been around for a really long time that does storytelling. And the reason I started listening to this podcast is I realized that I wanted to improve my listening skills. And I, I still have a long way to go improving my own listening skills. But The Moth is just folks from all over the spectrum, everywhere, and from all over the world, all kinds of backgrounds, just telling stories about their lives. And listening to this podcast and sort of slowing down, letting somebody fully tell their story without you jumping in. It's, again, another one of those magical experiences. I've, I've listened to so many stories through The Moth and... and they're absolutely amazing. So anybody who's just sort of interested in learning about other people and hearing experiences and becoming a better listener, I would say, listen to The Moth. 
Well, again, Josh, thank you so much for being here today, for being so thoughtful and wise. This has been a really fun conversation. As someone who's been a student myself and thought about how some teachers are just so much better than others, they just, again, want to express the gratitude and appreciation for you going into that field with such intentionality. We need more people like you. Much appreciated. I'm, I feel the same way about the past teachers I've had and, you know, taking on this career is really in a lot of ways to honor them. Thank you for listening to this episode of ms &E Stories and Voices, Graduating Student Profiles. This episode was produced and edited by me, Lindsay Aiken, with editing support from Jim Fabry. Our music was composed and performed by Catherine Barron, ms &E Master's Class of 2023. Please be sure to subscribe to us on Spotify or whichever platform you're listening on. And check out our website at msne.stanford.edu. That's msande.stanford.edu. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.